Chapter 35, Environmental Emergencies. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe for future updates. First, let's talk about cold. As it gets to winter time here, let's uh, get ourselves prepared. Things we're gonna, uh, possibilities where we're gonna see environmental emergencies in the cold, we wilderness. So we get all the uh, people going out, playing in the wilderness, uh, going on hikes, camping, hunting. Give us a, lot, a large opportunity there for wilderness uh, environmental emergencies. And we have rural settings, people wor just working in the rural areas, suburban and then urban. So we can have exposure in all these areas. And it can be as simple as they just lock themselves out of the house. The child gets locked out of the house, can't get in. They're urban outdoorsmen and don't have a place to stay that's not in the uh, uh, warm air. Or they uh, get lost in a snowstorm. We had a, a blizzard here, I believe, in 97, where we had several people get trapped in their cars overnight and several had hypothermic emergencies because they didn't have a way to stay warm. So just remember that uh, cold isn't the only thing that's going on sometimes. There may be medical problems or injuries on top of it. So you get a car crash on a mountain road they get injured and they're stuck out there in the cold and they get hypothermic. So lots of things to consider. They could be a multi-system trauma patient. Six ways the body gets rid of heat. Conduction with great uh, direct contact with an object or water chill. We had a gentleman that was sitting on Pikes Peak during the International Hill Climb one year sitting on a rock all day long. The end of the race comes, he doesn't move. People are concerned he's altered mental status. He'd been sitting on the cold rock all day and his body had been conducting heat into that rock and creating a state of hypothermia. Convection is the movement of air or water across the body surface. So you get the air moving around the body, it picks up the heat and takes it away. Uh, radiation, your body just gives off heat and it goes into the surrounding air. So that's, uh, you've seen somebody that's had a fever, you can feel the heat coming off their body. Evaporation occurs when the body perspires and gets wet. Or respirations, you just breathe. That's why you see your breath when you breathe in the cold air. That's heat coming out. This heat with a little moisture mixed in and causes just steam to come out. So we've got the exposure to cold reduces the body heat. Your core body temperature drops. Your body can't maintain it and eventually leads to death if we don't do something to intervene. Things that make it happen faster would be shock because you don't have the body fluid to maintain that heat. You don't have the perfusion to keep the heat moving around in your body. Injuries, infections, or immobility. You, as the muscles move, they create heat energy. Uh, same with infection and the injuries keep you from uh, having pro, uh, keep you from generating more heat. Diabetes with hypoglycemia. You need that glucose to go into the, the cells to help generate the ATP, which helps generate heat. If you don't have glucose and you don't have insulin to get the glucose in the cells, you don't have the uh, heat generation. And then people that are under the influence of drugs or alcohol have the inability to regulate their body temperatures as well. Subtle exposures, you may have some uh, ethanol, alcohol ingestion, People that are outside that have been drinking a lot, we see this typically in the uh, fall seasons when people are out in deer stands for way too long and they're drinking a little alcohol to keep warm. People with underlying conditions such as diabetes, COPD, uh, overdoses or poisonings, major traumas. The body doesn't have the ability to fight the trauma and maintain the heat at the same time. Outdoor resuscitations. Remember, we make people trauma naked to find out what their wounds are. We need to remember to cover them up so they don't lose heat and cause hypothermia. So we got to strip them down and then make them warm again. Decreased ambient temperature. It gets cold outside. 
and your body doesn't have the ability to keep up. As people get older, they lose the ability to generate heat in their body and they have thermal regulation. So we might have uh, people outside that do not have the right gear on, the right equipment, or they're uh, just un unable to maintain their body temperature because of their age. The other thing that happens that we can help with as EMS providers, thinking of our patient as a whole, is if they're on a fixed income, they try to figure out how to stretch their dollars as much as they can so they start turning down the heat or they uh, shut off certain rooms and try to maintain uh, their house with less heat throughout the house. If you run into a patient that needs help with their utilities, know your local resources. Almost all communities have some resource to help patients in the winter months maintain their heat. I know in our local community here we have plenty of options. So if you need somebody or have somebody needs some help, get them to the right resource. Pediatric note: uh, because kids have the trouble uh, putting clothes on after they take them off, they uh, tend to get in their sit situations where they can have more problems from uh, hypothermia. Plus, they don't have as much muscle mass as we do as adults. So they can't shiver and create that body, the body heat. When you're assessing the patient that's exposed to hypothermia, first stages are going to start shivering. That's the body trying to uh, generate heat by muscle contractions. Typically, this burns about a thousand calories an hour. So it's not going to last a long time. They're going to use up the energy they have. So that's another reason to understand why the patient needs that glucose or the insulin to get the glucose in the cells because it's using so much. They might start have numbness or loss of sensation in the extremities, the extremities, the nose, the ears. They'll be stiff with rigid posture. They, they can't move correctly. They lose their fine motor skills. They appear drowsy because their brain is starting to chill out and just uh, get get to the point where it's not providing the, the support that it needs. Rapid breathing and pulse, slow or absent breathing and pulse, depends on where they are in the hypothermia stages. Like I said, they lose motor coordination. That's something we train employees to look at in the safety world as we uh, tell them to watch for their their coworkers not having the coordination that they usually do. Decreased level of consciousness or unconscious. Cool, abdo uh, abnormally cool skin. Um, the abdominal cavity it gets cooled off quick. So you put your hand on their belly and it's cold to touch. The skin gets red, cyanotic, blotchy looking. Just kind of depends on where they are in the cooling stages. Two ways to warm a patient up. One is cover them up, put a nice warm blanket on them or a sleeping bag or something to try to try to get them warm and then get rid of their wet clothing. That's making that's having contact with their skin, causing conduction and they're losing heat. So strip them of all their wet clothing, put a blanket over them, get a nice warm blanket. The next thing we get uh, that's a passive active would be some type of external heat source. Apply hot packs to the groin and the armpits and the neck. Anywhere we've got large blood vessels coming to the surface, you put that heating source there and it's going to warm them up. You can also give them warm oxygen. Take the oxygen tubing and wrap it around a heat source and get kind of a, a cylindrical steel looking type of thing. And you can heat the oxygen before it goes in. So they're alert and responding appropriately, strip them down, put a blanket on them, provide support. And if you have the ability to, and they are competent to protect their own airway, you can give them warm liquids. If they're not able to protect their own airway or maintain the mental status, don't give them anything by mouth. And then you want to transport them to a treatment care facility. Even if you think they're fine, transport them. Just make sure we're doing okay. 
if they have a uh, frozen body part, we put it in a tepid water. Not hot, not cold, but warm enough. And then you want to change out the water as it cools. As the If the foot is uh, really cold, it's going to cool off the water quicker than you think. So you're going to switch, switch it out as soon as possible. It's extreme hypothermia. The patient's unre unresponsive. No vital signs. What happens is the pulse can slow down to 10 beats a minute. So when we're checking pulses, we're not going to just check that 6 to 15 seconds. We're going to check up to a minute. If you don't have a pulse, you start CPR. You shock them if you can. The problem with AEDs is that if they are hypothermic, the heart very rarely defibrillates. But you're going to not know what the temperature of the heart is, so you're going to shock anyway. The, the other thing we need to remember on hypothermia patients is they're not dead until they're warm and dead. And hopefully we get return of circulation and then we can put them back into hypothermia. They're unresponsive or responding inappropriate. Maintain the airway, lots of oxygen. Pass it through warm water, humidifier. Uh, if you've got a humidifier in the ambulance, tape some of the hot packs to the outside of it. If you don't, wrap the tubing around it, put some gauze around it. Take one of our vacuum splints. Put the tubing and a hot pack inside the vacuum splint and then secure it. And that will help warm the air up as it goes. Get some warm blankets, anything you can do to warm them up and transport to the appropriate facility. Frostbite or localized cold injuries. Mostly affecting ears, nose, fingers, hands, toes, and feet. These are because those are the most distal portions and they have poor circulation. What happens when the body part gets cold is it does blood vessel constriction. This allows the blood to pool and freeze in those areas. When water or the plasma freezes, it forms ice crystals. There used to be a, a concern that you would, or a, a method to take care of frostbite by rubbing the body part. Think about rubbing a cell that has an ice crystal in it and what happens to that cellular membrane. If they have superficial frost nip, get them out of the cold. That's your first step. Cover them up, warm them up. If you've got frostbite, it's actually freezing the tissue, oxygen, Treat them like a burn, cover it, and gently transport to the hospital. Here's a picture of what frostbite looks like. It's that black area on the fingertips. They're going to treat this just like a burn. They're going to debride it. They're going to try to get the skin to grow back and proceed from there. If you have permission... Call your medical control and say, hey, I've got this going on. This is my transport time, and this is the situation I'm in right now. You can do an active rewarming process. You take lukewarm water and a container to fully immobilize the injured body part, and then you start rotating the water through as it defrosts. Water temperature between 100 and 105, so that's about the temperature of a hot tub. So it's not uncomfortable, but it's warm enough to start warming the body a little bit above normal temperature. As you put the body part in, you want to make sure there's nothing on it. No clothing, no jewelry, no bands, no straps. And warm it up gently. Stir the water. Change out the water back and forth. Once it's completely rewarmed, you take it out, you dry it off, and dress it with a sterile dry dressing. Maintain the uh, patient's body heat. They're still going to have some coldness in their body, so you're going to keep them under a blanket. Keep the body part from getting cold again, and monitor your patient. Because you've just changed the circulation of a body part that was frozen, there are other things that can happen. You can have pulmonary embolisms. They can throw a clot to create a stroke. They can have a clot to car, cause a myocardial infarction. 
So you're very careful you need to watch these people. Opposite, exposure to heat. The body can try to get rid of some heat. It can try to uh, sweat and maintain a good body temperature, but at the point where you have the loss of that ability to control the heat, you develop hypothermia. hyperthermia. If you do not treat it, it will cause death. Uh, the body gives you plenty of warning signs along the way. You start having heat cramps and heat exhaustion. Normal to cool skin, pale, moist. Your body's trying to compensate. You're trying to get rid of the heat by evaporation, so you're really sweating. When your radiator run dry, runs dry, you get hot, dry skin, occasionally moist, but mostly hot, dry, and that's the sign of heat stroke. Your altered mental status, your system's dry, you're not able to control it, and your body temperature is 105 to 107. So patients with pale, moist, normal to cool skin, that's heat exhaustion. The body loses salt, bringing muscle cramps. Uh, you're going to have uh, some types of shock because of your, your body lo uh, fluid loss. Typically, this happens the first few months of summer when the people aren't exposed to heat or they're in an environment they're not used to. This is a common thing we ran into in Las Vegas when I was working there. Is people that weren't used to the heat didn't think it was going to be a big deal because it's a dry heat. And they would go out and uh, not drink enough. They start to develop muscle cramps, weakness, exhaustion, rapid shallow breathing. We're not we're trying to get rid of the heat, but we're not efficient at it. Heavy perspiration possible loss of consciousness but they're they're trying to control the heat what you want to do is get them out of the hot environment give them oxygen take off or remove their clothing loosen it up put them in a supine position keep their blood flow normal to the head but you want as much body surface exposed to the top so you can get rid of heat you may want to give them sips of water if they're able to control their airway Moist towels and transport to the hospital. Cool them off as much as you can. If they've got hot, dry skin, it's a heat stroke. They have lost the ability to control their body heat, and you want to get them cooled off into the hospital as quick as possible. They'll have lack of conscious or loss of consciousness or alter mental status. Rapid breathing, full rapid pulse, lots of weakness if they're conscious, little or no perspiration. Ones I've seen, they've, they've stopped perspiring completely. Pupils will be dilated because they're dropping uh, uh, epinephrine in their body to try to compensate. And they'll possibly have having seizures. Get them out of the heat. Get them out of the area that's causing the problem. Take their clothing off. Get them stripped down as little as you can so you can get some lots of surface area there so they're able, you're able to take care of them. Cool packs to the neck, groin, and armpits. As much coolness as you can get. You want to make sure they're, uh, they're, you're cooling down as everything as you can. Uh, if you've got a young child, that's you can put in water to that. You can drop them down uh, their temperature fairly quickly, but not cold water. You don't want to create hypothermia on the patient. You just want to cool them off. Uh, administer lots of oxygen and immediate transport. You let the hospital know you're coming. They will get an ice bath set up for them and cool them off as quick as possible. If you cool them off too much, too fast, you're going to stimulate their body to uh, actually have the shivers like you would for a hypothermic patient and kind of counteract while you're doing uh, so you want to be careful how you do this um, heart is prone to dysrhythmias so keep an eye on them and if their pulse changes maybe hook the AED up give them a shock if they're going to need it and then help them sweat put cool moist towels on them help them uh, get rid of that uh, that body heat 
So on to water-related emergencies. Places we're going to run into water, boating, skiing, windsurfing, jet skiing, kayaking, diving, scuba diving. Any kind of sport we do in the water, you're going to have the risk of having water-related incidents. People with uh, di uh, water injuries, wear way obstruction. If you have a patient that is underwater, typically it's not water causing the air obstruction. It's a muscle spasm that's trying to keep the air, uh, the water out of the lungs. So that's a fairly easy one to get out. But once you get up onto the surface with the patient, you need to turn their head to the side and get the water out of the way. Cardiac arrest. Prolonged hypo hypoxia causing the cardiac arrest. They may have a sign of a heart attack just because of the uh, endurance or the, uh, the stress they put on the heart. Injuries to the head or neck from diving incidents. Internal injuries from impact. Could have hypothermia. In Colorado, we consider all water-related emergencies as cold water drownings. Just because our, our water temperatures here don't get high enough to cause or to be uh, considered warm water, so even in the summer, our, our diving emergencies, our water emergencies, are considered cold water injuries. Substance abuse—they lack the ability to solve the problems they get themselves into, and then drownings in gen general. According to the WHO. Draining of the prosthetics, experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion or immersions in a liquid. You can suffer a drowning without death. Death is one of the options. You can have morbidity or no morbidity. So that's uh, long-term effects or no long-term effects. When a patient is in the position where they're drowning, they're going to start struggling. They're going to start fighting to stay up on top of the surface. As they get to the point where they don't have the energy or the will to survive, they take one last deep breath, and then they go down and under. Water can enter the airway, they cough, they swallow, or they get more water in their lungs as they're going down. But typically, a, wet, a dry, a freshwater drowning doesn't have a lot of water in the lungs, so we're good there. They have that uh, spasm of the larynx, seals off the airway, and because of that, they have hypothermia or hypoxia, but they don't have water in the lungs, so you don't have to put them over the horse and jog them in circles. You just have to get them up to the surface and out of the water. Rescue breathing in or out of the water, it's your choice. If you are talented enough to do it while you're dragging them out of the water, that is perfectly fine. Get them breathing as quick as possible. If you uh, have a non-breathing patient in the water, get them semi-supine and provide ventilations. Lifeguards train how to do this. If you're not trained, don't do it. If you have problems getting air to go in, that's when we apply more force. This is where the FRO PVD, the Flow Restriction Oxygen Powered Ventilatory Device, comes in handy. You can apply that extra pressure to force the air in past the obstructions to pass the water. Any patient that's in the water and unconscious, we assume they're unconscious because of a head injury. So we're going to take the time to put them on a backboard, secure them to that board, and secure the head before we get them out of the water. Don't aggravate spinal injuries, but ABCs come first. If you have to secure the airway, you secure the airway and then worry about the spinal next. Keep everything in line. Lifeguards learn how to take patients out of the water carefully onto the backboard. So if you're in a situation, let them help you. Uh, listen to your dispatch. Tell them what's going on. Tell the hospital what's going on. Make sure everybody knows that uh, the patient's coming in the way they are. Diving accidents. Typically, this is the 16 to 24, 24 year old male with young females on the beach or on the uh, side of the creek. 
and they're watching what happened and they dove in and hit the rock head first. They can have all kinds of injuries, so do a complete full assessment and then just treat the injuries you find. Scuba diving accidents, we've got a couple of things we're going to run into here. Arterial gas embolisms. When a diver holds his breath coming up out of the, the, the lower depths of a dive, this causes the nitrogen to expand in the blood and causes the air embolism. They don't have the right training. They had a failure or some type of emergency or they ran out of air. We had a patient one time that was about 110 feet, ran out of air. And instead of buddy breathing with his buddy that was there with him, he decided to swim to the surface. As he gets closer to the surface, he loses consciousness and pops up in the middle of six of us that had gone diving after we completed a shift on the ambulance. So he was surrounded by paramedics. Not a good chance of survival with that many paramedics, but he still came through and did okay. Decompression illness. This is one where you don't decompress as you come up, and it causes that uh, uh, air embolism in your system. It's usually 1 to 48 hours after you uh, have the 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 lack of judgment when you're coming up. Typically, we see these in our region at the airports where people are getting off flights. They had to get that one last flight in before they ran to the airport to come home. They get on the flight. It's pressurized. They come back up to altitude, get off the flight, and the symptoms start to show up. They have the altered mental status, rapid loss of consciousness, blurred vision, seizures. So typically this is a call to the airport for a patient that's unresponsive. You ask where they came from, Cancun, Cozumel, somewhere where they've been diving, and you can put all the pieces together and say we possibly have an air embolism. They may have paralysis in the extremities, symptoms of stroke if the air embolism went to the brain, general weakness, tingling, frothy blood in the nose and mouth. They may have incontinence, chest pain, or showing the signs of stroke there. They can cause myocardial infarction or respiratory arrest. They can have decompression illness, altered mental status and other related symptoms. Uh, they have fatigue, muscle pains, blotchy skin, modeling of the skin. They just don't look good. So decompression, illness, you're still also going to have numbness and paralysis, choking, coughing, dyspnea. They're going to have that air embolism, the pulmonary embolism, and pedal edema and swelling. So they look like a CHF patient for us here. Treatment, maintain airway. Give them oxygen and transport. Either supine on either side, you may consider putting their feet up. That will help the uh, the air embolism issue too for you. Call medical direction and tell them what you've got and where you're going with the patient. In Colorado Springs, our only hospital with a deco with a hyperbaric chamber would be U um, UC Health Memorial Central. So know your system and where your options are. If you've got a patient that is still in the water. Only go in if you're properly equipped and trained. If you're not properly equipped and trained, your first option is reach out to the patient. Take a stick and hand it to them. Maybe you want to throw a rope to them with something that can float. Do not throw a rope with an anchor on it. You want to throw it with a life buoy so they can grab it and pull. If you have the option, row a boat out to them. Get your boat, your kayak, something to row out to them. And last resort is you swim. The danger with swimming out to the patient is you become a victim too. And we don't want that. You can't help anybody. And you just gave the second responders even more work to do if they've got to find you too. So here's what it looks like. You reach, row, throw, and go. Ice rescue. 
If you do not know how to do ice rescue, do not attempt to do it. There are specialized training for this one, specialized uh, rescue suits. Little, they call them gumby suits. They're uh, uh, dry suits that they wear to go out on the ice. The local fire department practices that almost every year, getting dogs off the ice and occasionally people. So you protect yourself first, and we use the same process. Throw, throw, row, go. So reach, throw, row, go. Once you get the patient out, you've got a hypothermia issue. The good thing about hypothermia in ice water is that your chance of survival goes up because of the coldness of the water. I had an EMT student who brought in an article about his brother that had fallen under the ice in Minnesota and he was under the water for 60 minutes. They pulled him out and had, he had no neural deficits after he recovered. So there's a lot. Uh, there we do a lot to try to save these people, because there's a, a high chance of survival if we can get all the pieces to fall into place. Transport them to the hospital. When you're on ice, don't work alone, and then don't walk on the ice unless you're properly trained and equipped. Okay, high altitude emergencies. We run into this one here occasionally in Colorado. As you go up in altitude, you have less air to breathe and the air pressure changes. So commonplace, my students, it seems like they there's a group of them that end up working at the summit of Pikes Peak. And they typically tell me they run into these illnesses all the time. They will get patients that get off the cog railway that have a pulse ox of 60 and they're having shortness of breath severe headaches and uh, just uh, all the signs of the altitude sickness. So acute mountain sickness, they're having uh, trouble adjusting to the air. They're nauseated, they have, uh, they're dehydrated, so just sit them down, give them some oxygen, give them some, uh, some, uh, something to drink, and they usually perk up right away. That's what we tell people if you're at altitude, drink lots of water. High altitude cerebral edema. They have headaches that get worse. Loss of balance because of the edema in the brain. Fatigue, seizures, altered mental status, loss of consciousness. Care for these people is get them off the mountain. If you can get them down to lower altitude, their symptoms resolve almost immediately. Give them oxygen, provide supportive care, whatever you need, but to get them to a lower altitude so that we can reduce the exposure and make them better. It's the same thing for the heat and cold. Get them out of the offending environment, and they do. The other version of high altitude Ill illnesses would be the high altitude pulmonary edema. Very similar to the cerebral edema, but a little bit more serious because breathing's kind of important for us. They have a dry cough that may progress to coughing up blood. So they get that pink frothy sputum like we have for every other pulmonary edema. They're tachypneic and they are tachycardiac. They may have a mild fever, so their body's kind of fighting off this uh, Pulmonary edema, O2 sat, um, is low, real low, and they may progress to pulmonary failure or rest. Get them down, uh, low altitude, lots of oxygen, and provide support. Almost every year during the uh, Pikes Peak Hill Climb, they have patients with both of these symptoms of they come to watch the races and don't get acclimated and they stay up there all day and then have these symptoms is as simple as bringing them down to low altitude. Let's talk about some bites and stings. All spiders are venomous. The good thing is spiders only attack if they feel threatened. So you can let a black widow crawl across your hand and unless you trap it 
or squish it, it's not going to try to bite you. I've done it myself. It's 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 a different experience, but the the spiders do not attack unless uh, you provoke them. The good thing is spiders have enough venom to kill their prey. And last time I checked, we are not the prey of a spider. So their, their venom may be a dangerous to local tissue. It is not systemically dangerous to you. Uh, insect stings, rare occurrences, but when they happen, the problem we run into is the anaphylactic shock. So we want to try to get rid of the stingers as soon as possible so we don't get the their their venom as much as or uh, limit our exposure to the venom but we want to be watching the patient for difficulty breathing swelling and other issues there this is a picture of a brown recluse spider that is probably the one most dangerous ones i know of because it actually does necrosis of the tissue and they end up having to debride that and possibly cut out pieces of the skin and tissue below Signs and symptoms, we're looking for uh, anaphylactic signs and symptoms for our more serious patients. So we have the altered mental status. We have bites or stings or uh, on the skin, puncture, puncture marks. Document where these are, and I like to even circle them with a Sharpie on the skin so I can find them later in case they uh, swell up. Localized pains, got, uh, blotchy skin. Possibly some numbness or tingling in the extremity that gets bad. A burning sensation, redness, swelling, blistering. They may get altered mental status or weakness. Difficulty breathing, headache or dizziness. All signs that they are starting to have some anaphylactic issues. If it's some type of infection because of the bite, they're going to have chills and, chills and fever. Maybe some nausea, vomiting, muscle cramping. Depends on what the insect was. They may have excessive sal uh, salivation and sweating. So like I said, they're all moving towards the anaphylaxis concern. Treatment. Treat for the shock. If you're not sure, call medical control. Tell them what they got bit by and what you think the treatment might be. If it's anaphylactic, then you definitely want to uh, do the epinephrine. Otherwise, there may be some antivenom that they need to get a hold of, and they, uh, your hospital needs to know that so they can call and get that trans or transported to them. If you can remove the stinger and venom sac, do not grab the stinger because the venom sac is attached to the stinger, and you squeeze it, you squeeze the venom in. It's like kind of defeats your purpose. So you're going to want to take your ID card and just flick the stinger out. Remove the... Uh, Jewelry on the affected limbs, constricting bands above and below. Um, keep it kind of isolated and mobilize the limb, put a splint on them, move it around. Snake bites, you have to have some special care, but they're usually not life threatening. Even our uh, rattlesnakes here in Colorado, you don't have an issue with life threats. You've got 12 hours usually to get to the hospital. The problem we run into sometimes is you have the anaphylactic reaction. That's a life threat, and then you uh, address that with the epi. Keep the calm. Keep the patient calm. Keep yourself calm, too. Immobilize the body part and keep it below the heart. You can put a constrictive bandage around, not a tourniquet. We don't want to stop the blood flow. We just want to stop the lymphatic flow. We do carry rattlesnake and a venom here in Colorado Springs. So if you have a patient that's bit by a rattlesnake, we have it at all the hospital systems so we can get that to them. The kind we don't carry are the more exotic animals that we might find as pets or at zoos. The good thing here is that our zoo carries the antivenom for the ones they have. So if you have a handler bit, by a snake at the zoo, they typically have the resources you need. You'll notice bite marks. They'll have two fangs that go into the skin. That's a typical uh, bite mark for most of our venomous snakes. 
takes 30 minutes to hours to start having issues there. So, you, like I said, you've got time. They may have rapid pulse and labor breathing. Again, keep the body part below the heart. Use a constrictive band and keep the patient calm. They may have vision problems, uh, general weakness, nausea, vomiting, seizure, dr uh, drowsiness, or unconsciousness. Depends on how they're reacting to the toxins. Care. Call for medical direction. Tell them what you're coming in with. They will get the antivenom. Typically, they do not give the antivenom to patients. They watch them to see how they're reacting and keep the antivenom if they need it. Uh, they've found that there's more side effects from the antivenom than the actual venom. So treat for shock. Document where the fang marks are. That's where I, again, use a pen and circle it. Take the jewelry off. Keep everything immobilized and transport to the appropriate facility. Do not bring the snake with you to the hospital. That is one way to clear out the ER almost as quick as bringing the chemical. Uh, throw the bag up on the counter. Say, here's a snake that bit him. You will not have anybody there left in that room. Uh, so do not bring the snake with you. Identify what it is. We can guess pretty sh we're pretty sure what they are if they've got two fang marks and it's here in Colorado because it's rattlesnakes. Other parts southeast, uh, south southeast uh, United States, you have cottonmouths and uh, copperheads, water moccasins. Those are the ones that are a little bit more dangerous because they don't have fangs. They just chew on you. We typically don't have a lot of marine life issues here in Colorado. But you can have people that eat the wrong marine, uh, marine life. So I haven't seen any restaurants serving puffer fish. But if you don't know how to pre prepare it, it can be a problem for you. The problem we run into is uh, the stings and punctures. If you're in an area that has jellyfish... Um, or uh, stingrays, know what they are, know the difference. Rinse the uh, toxin off with some fresh water and uh, clean everything up. As always, if you have questions, write them down, bring them to class, look them up on Google and tell me the answer and enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks.